else does. Okay. Um, go ahead. Oh, we need to unmute. Unmute. There, there we go. How's that? So everyone can see a hummingbird. Thumbs up. Excellent. And everyone can hear me. We're in business. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for having me tonight. Um, some of some people were in the chat earlier, but I'll just sort of, I guess, introduce myself before we get into the talk. So obviously my name is Glenn Bartley and I'm a professional wildlife photographer from Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. Um, and if you are familiar with my work, you know that I pretty much only photograph birds. And more specifically, I really love traveling down to the sort of the new world tropics. So, you know, Central and South America and the Caribbean and trying to find these really rare and spectacular birds to try and capture beautiful images that perhaps birds people have never you know seen pictures of before so that's what really excites me about bird photography um part of the way in which i've been able to make this my career which is kind of a challenging thing to do is that i lead photography tours or workshops to some of these exciting places and over the last decade or so in teaching lots of people about bird photography, I, you know, I've, I've noticed that sometimes people like to, or not like to, but people tend to often overcomplicate the process or add too many variables in or, and that's kind of led to my teaching style, which sort of is my segue into tonight's talk. Um, I love to simplify the process as much as possible to strip it down, make it as straightforward because just sometimes getting the darn bird in your lens is hard enough. So if we can simplify things and just focus on the most important aspects, then I think we can all walk away with better photos and a better experience. So that's my segue into tonight's talk, Bird Photography Simplified, my approach to capturing images. So the plan for tonight is the, the biggest part of the talk is the first point there, which is seven elements of a great bird photo. Uh, we're going to go through all of those. That's really the meat of this of tonight's talk. And then we're going to talk about a few other things. Uh, doing your homework, you know, my approach to sort of research and planning, which I really, really, really uh, think leads to more successful images. Uh, I'll talk about my strategy when I'm in the field, again, keeping it simple. Uh, we'll talk a bit about actually building a portfolio, not just certain nice images, but actually creating a portfolio. We're going to touch on the digital darkroom, but of course the scope of this talk is not, I mean, we could spend, we could have multiple talks just about the digital darkroom, but you know, I didn't want to totally skip it. Um, talk a little bit about sharing your work. And then of course, <laughs> if you know any bird photographers or if you are one yourself, you know, we love equipment. So we'll talk a little bit about equipment. And certainly if you have any questions about equipment, we can address those. And that will bring us to the end of the talk where we can we can have a Q&A session if anyone has any questions. Um, I'll perhaps, well, my, web, my website will be mentioned at the end. Um, and on there, it's very easy to find my contact info. If you, ever, if you think of a question tomorrow, you want to send me an email, please do so. And you'll, that'll be easy for you to find. So without further ado, let's get into the talk. So like I said, there's going to be times in the talk when I'm going to throw questions out to you guys and right away we're into one of those. So like I said, the first part of the talk is all about seven elements of a great bird photograph. And so my question to you guys is, what do you think some of them might be? Feel free to hit your space bar and suggest anything you have. A clean background. Okay, that's a good one, Janet. What else we got? Sharpness. Sharpness, good one. Aperture. What about the aperture? It'll give you that bokeh behind the subject to make it stand out and separate. Okay, yeah, so maybe building on Janet's point there. The bird doing something interesting. That's a good one. That's a good one for sure. So something dynamic, something more than just a static pose. What else we got? Okay, I'm gonna, oh, we got one more. Catch light. A catch light in the eye, yeah. So that maybe yeah. ties in with like sort of the sharpness of the eye and having that yeah. that catch light and that sort of connection to the photo that's yeah, definitely have to have a, good a flash one. to get that though right uh you know, no well it a... depends so if you're shooting in in natural light with the sun you'll certainly have a catch light or even a cloudy day um 
like for example, this image was would have been taken in overcast conditions, it looks like, and you still see the, the bit of the sky there. Oh. It just depends how we're, that depends really specific, but absolutely the flash can add a catch light. We'll talk a bit about that later. So I think I'll skip to my list now. You guys got some good ones there. This is what I had for sort of the seven elements of a great bird photograph. So of course you could have all the other aspects perfectly, but if you botch the exposure and you dramatically under or overexpose the image, it's probably not gonna matter too much, is it? We all know that photography is sort of the art of capturing light. And you know, if we did all the other things, but we only went out and took photographs at high noon in the peak of summer, we are probably not gonna have the best bird photos. So learning about light, what types of light, quality of light, direction of light, all those things, super important. Um, no one mentioned composition. So in our final photos, certainly a well-composed image is I think pretty essential. Um, sharpness was certainly touched on. Um, nobody mentioned the perch. For me, the perch is so important. So imagine you have, again, all these other things of this beautiful bird and he's sitting on a fence post or you know, a car or a telephone wire. Obviously that photo is gonna be maybe lacking a little something. Um, the background was certainly touched on and we talked a little bit about really a blurred out background and that certainly can be nice, but we're gonna talk a bit more about that when we get into it. Um, and uh, the final one I had there was the pose, which I think is really important too for, for a pleasing image that, that you have sort of like eye contact and a nice, position of the bird relative to the perch and all this kind of stuff. And then my last point there, as I said, a great photo should, you know, should probably pay attention to all of these things, but there's also something that I'm calling the X factor, which is something that takes the photo to the next level. So we're going to, we're going to get there eventually, but to start with, let's talk a little bit about exposure. So, you know, obviously it depends on how uh, experience of a photographer you are, but I think it's really important to not glaze over exposure. Um, and I think it's just super important. Like if you had some brand new photographer who just went to B&H and bought a brand new camera and came out with me in the field, one of the first things I'd want to know and want to teach them is how to control these very important three variables. And of course, I'm talking about the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. Understanding what each of those things does, the function of it, and how to use the three together to create a well-balanced exposure. Um, so of course, ISO, we're mainly talking about the quality of the image, whether it's gonna be really noisy at a high ISO or a nice clean image at a lower ISO. Shutter speed is gonna help us if we're trying to capture motion or if we are dealing with a really slower shutter speed, our own motion might become a problem and we won't have sharp photos if we don't have an adequate shutter speed. Um, and then, of course, the aperture can help us to really blur out the background, as was mentioned, or maybe we want an image where we have lots of the image in focus. Um, so just depending on what we're going for, we need to understand what each of those variables does and then how to balance them out in order to create a correct exposure. Um, the second thing I want to mention here is that it's really important that we understand that, unfortunately, the camera is not as sophisticated as our eyes and brain are. The camera can't see the world like we do. So in high contrast scenes or in a variety of scenarios, you're not gonna get what you, what you see when you take a picture. So let, let me give you a little example of that. So this is a very oversimplified illustration, but essentially imagine that we had a very black bird, a kind of medium toned bird, and then a very bright white bird, and that the bird was very big in the frame and we had a sort of medium toned background. Now the camera's, always trying to balance the exposure. So the black bird, if we just took the picture at the metered reading, might actually look kind of washed out. The medium toned bird on the medium toned background would probably be okay. And if the, bird was, if the bird was bright enough and big enough in the frame, it actually might wind up looking a bit underexposed. Now you guys being from a snowy region of the world would know, for example, that if you went out and tried to take a nice snowy scene picture, and you just took it at the metered reading right in the middle that you look at the picture and it actually doesn't, the snow doesn't really look white, does it? It kind of looks light gray and you actually have to add light to such a scene in order to actually show it to be white. And of course, again, that's because the camera is always trying to average out the scene. So if you point it at something that's pure white, it's gonna make it gray. Um, 
So how would we adjust the camera to get it to see things how we want them to do? Well, the black bird, we might have to underexpose a little bit. The medium tone bird, we'd probably leave it right in the middle. And the white bird, we'd have to overexpose. Now, like I said, big oversimplification, but just to get it into your head that you have to think about how does the camera see the world and how does your, your own eyes see the world? I see that Mrs. Claus has arrived. <laughs> um, so with that said, we can try to make our lives easy. Remember, it's all about simplifying things. So what I'm always saying to my clients when we're out in the field and I see them sort of in a challenging lighting scenario is I'm always saying, look past your subject and try to balance your subject with the background. So let me skip ahead to the next slide here. This is something that I see all the time, the situation on the right here. So we have this beautiful, weird looking blue bird that's landed on a branch and people are so excited to take a picture of the blue bird that they just start blasting away. And oh, then it's sky in the background. It's, oh, it's a silhouette. So I'm gonna start adding light. And next thing you know, you have this high key blue turkey on a branch, which is probably not what you're after. Instead of that, it's so much better to just sort of look around a little bit and see, well, the bird in this situation, you can see that it's a cloudy day. So the bird is in flat light. That means that those trees there would also be in flat light. So it would be really easy to balance this exposure by simply moving to the left and lining up the bird with the trees. This might seem very, very obvious, but it's often overlooked. And this can really help to simplify exposure decisions in the field. If you just remember, try to balance the light on the subject and the background, and um, that will really help. Now, when I started taking pictures, it was in the era of slide film, probably the same for many of you. And it was much more difficult because we of course didn't have that immediate feedback. We had to wait days or weeks to get our slides back. And it was really hard to learn or to remember what you even did when you were changing settings and stuff like that. Now, of course, we have these amazing tools. And on all of our cameras now, I think the most amazing, interesting, important piece of information is your histogram when it comes to exposure. So it's super important that we understand what is the histogram, what is it trying to show us, and how can we use the histogram in order to create a proper exposure. This is not just for bird photography, of course, this is for any type of photography. Now, if you're gonna remember one kind of like key take home from this presentation tonight, this would be a good one to remember, is the classic rule, you've probably heard it before, which is to expose to the right. Now, if you haven't heard it before, what am I talking about? Well, here's a histogram, I move my head out of the way. And it doesn't matter the shape of the histogram, just as a refresher for those who aren't super familiar, I have to do everything backwards here. So this side of the histogram is the brightest white part of the histogram, the bright brightest white part of the image. And the other side, I don't think my hand will get over there, the other side is the darkest part of the image, so the blacks. And by when I say exposed to the right, what I mean is ideally when you look at your histogram, when you're taking a picture, you'll have some data in that histogram. So in this case, it's hard to move my hand. <laughs> there we go. It's this little tail here that I'm talking about coming down just about to the right side of the image. What that's telling us is that there's some part of the image that's almost white but that nothing's getting blown out. We don't see a big peak up against the right side, but we are, we're pushing the exposure as far to the right as we can without blowing anything out. And that is exactly what you wanna do with almost all types of nature photography or bird photography. The reason is that it gives you the best possible digital file to then bring into the digital darkroom. Even if, even if it winds up looking a little bit washed out when you take the picture, that's the, we're capturing the most amount of digital data. It's very easy to add shadow detail in post-processing, but what is not easy to do is to fix highlights if you've blown them out. So while I say exposed to the right, we don't wanna see that big peak at the side there. If you have your camera enabled to show you flashing highlights, we don't really want blown out highlights, at least not on the part of the image that we're interested in, like the bird or the background. Um, sometimes if you were shooting into like a bright white sky, maybe you'd have to accept a blown out background. But in general, just remember, exposed to the right, don't blow out the highlights. 
Sometimes those images right out of the camera, like I said, will look a little washed out, but they will give us the most potential. So you might think, well, Glenn told me expose to the right. And if I just do that, every photo I take will be spectacular and amazing. I wish it was that easy. But the reality is that, that some birds and some images just require nearly ideal conditions. So I put an example here. This is a beautiful species of duck that lives uh, near where I live. I took this picture a couple kilometers from my house. Uh, it's a harlequin duck, if you're not familiar. And a bird like this, an image like this, it, it requires, you know, I, I couldn't have taken this image in a dark overcast day, even at all overcast, to be honest, because what makes this image for me is the beautiful blue water that requires blue sky. Um, the, the nice um, contrast we have in the image where I'm not blowing out the whites, but I still have detail in the blacks, that I have a little bit of that iridescent sheen on the bird's head. That requires nice, beautiful, low angle sunlight and a blue sky. So I just wanted to put this in here to say like, you can do everything correct in your camera and it might still not be a very nice photo, but at least we need to start with those, those skills, right? Now, sometimes I get the situation where I feel like people believe they're like a second class citizen if they don't shoot 100% in manual mode. And I've even heard some of my sort of counterparts, other instructors sort of like talking condescendingly to their pupils about, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll teach you how to shoot manual. You're only shooting aperture priority, don't worry, I'll teach you. But I really think that that's total garbage. I personally think you should shoot in whatever mode you're most comfortable in, whatever one yields the best results, whatever one you are able to control your camera more effectively. With that said, I do believe there are certain scenarios that it definitely makes sense to shoot manual in. So this is an example. This is a beautiful female northern pintail, um, again, at a local spot here in Victoria. Um, and you might get a sense from the background here that she, was, she could have been flying against quite a variety of different backgrounds here. Very dark trees, kind of sunlit trees, bright sky, water. If I was shooting aperture priority here, trying to track a fast moving bird and trying to adjust my exposure compensation, exposure compensation at the same time while tracking a moving subject, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a professional, but I can't do that. That's not really possible to, to do, to make those kinds of exposure changes on the fly like that. So instead, in a situation like this, the light on the bird throughout the scene, whether she's up against the sky the trees or the water, the light on her is not changing. So it would make way more sense to just lock in my manual settings for the bird and then whatever happens to the background happens. But that would certainly be a, a better approach than trying to shoot aperture priority and cross your fingers and hope for the best. Because in aperture priority, if she went up against the bright sky, she would go to almost like a silhouette. And if she went down against the really dark water, she, those white feathers on her wings would probably blow out, right? So it's better to just lock in the correct exposure for the bird in a situation like this and let the background do as it will do. Another situation in which I will sometimes just shoot manual just because it's sort of a little bit easier and a little bit more consistent is if I'm in a blind and nothing, not many variables are changing. So in this situation, I was in a blind, I set up a perch near a little seed feeder and all the birds were landing there. So I knew where they're gonna land. I knew what my background's gonna be. It was an overcast day. So my light really wasn't changing. So it kind of, what can happen in those situations though is maybe a little beam of light hits just your background and that might throw off your exposure on the subject. So sometimes when, when I'm in a really constant situation, I'll also switch to shoot manual, just another op option. Another situation in which I'll sometimes switch and shoot manual, because I guess I should have said, I tend to shoot about 90, 95% in aperture priority mode, just the way my brain thinks, just how I like to do it. But like I said, sometimes I will shoot manual. Um, in this situation, we have a very dark scene. We have a very dark bird, but when it flashes its iridescence, it's quite a bit brighter. In aperture priority, there'd be a tendency to be blowing out the iridescent highlights. So again, an opportunity to shoot manual. So that's the end of our exposure section. And now we're gonna move on to talking about light. Like we said, photography is all about light. Light is all important 
in our image taking, whatever our subjects are. When I first started taking pictures, um, again, like I said, it was the film days and I got into it and I started reading all kinds of photography books. And one of the first ones I read was by a photographer called Freeman Patterson. And I remember the first chapter was called Learning to See. At the time, I kind of didn't really know what he was talking about, but now I kind of understand that what he was really talking about was learning to see and understand light, quality of light, direction of light, quantity of light. Learning to see like the camera sees and learning to understand light is so important if we're gonna take really good images. So when we're shooting in direct light, I have a little trick that I always tell people I'm in the field with, which is if you're shooting in direct light, meaning you have a shadow, there are shadows, um, the sun is out. Um, I, one trick I always use is I just look and see my shadow. And if my shadow is longer than I am tall, so I'm about six feet tall. So if my shadow is longer than six feet, I know that I have good quality of light to shoot in. The light is low enough in the sky that it's hitting the subject directly, not causing any really harsh shadows, harsh lighting. Um, but as soon as my shadow gets shorter than I am tall, pack it up, time to take a break. If it's the morning shoot, time to throw in the towel for the day and wait until the light gets good again in the afternoon. Um, if you just sort of stay out there and keep shooting, really what you're doing is just wasting your time because you're never gonna get really great images in harsh, harsh light. So remember the shadow trick. Now it would be great if we could just put a spotlight on the top of our camera and broadcast out this quality of light on any subject that we ever see. That would be amazing, but it's not possible. This image is of a Hudsonian Godwit. This is up way up north in the tundra up on uh, Hudson's Bay here in Canada. And this was probably at like 11 p.m. right around the summer solstice. Just beautiful low angle light. My shadow would have been, you know, 100 feet long here. Um, beautiful golden hour light. Here's another example. This is way up in Nome, up in Alaska. One in the morning, maybe, for this one. Beautiful, beautiful golden light. Amazing to shoot in. Now, again, when I started out, I thought, well, that's what you always want, right? You always want golden hour light because it's so beautiful, spectacular. I love those images. But when I started traveling to the tropics and I started shooting in the Andes, I realized that that light is extremely hard to come by. So imagine a huge mountain range where the sun, you're near the equator and the sun gets up very quickly. By the time it even, often you're in a valley and by the time it even clears the ridge, it's already harsh. And if it's not already harsh, it's harsh very quickly. So if you're waiting for that beautiful golden low angle light, you're gonna be waiting a long time. So I've learned to love overcast light. When I'm traveling, I'm always happy. If, if I look at a forecast, if I'm gonna to go to Columbia for a month and I look at a forecast and every single day is cloudy, I'm excited because that means that I'm gonna be able to stay out in the field longer. I'm gonna be able to shoot for more hours of the day. More important than that even is that I don't have to worry about the direction of my light. So if a bird, let's say the sun would have been over here and a bird lands over there on that side of the road or the forest or whatever, if it was sunny, I, I couldn't shoot him. I'd have to try to get around the other side of the bird in order to have my light direction. Well, the other side of the bird might be a cliff that I clearly, I'm committed to my craft, but I'm not that committed. So very, very, very often, the sun poses tremendous challenges in a you know, mountainous terrain like that. Um, and like I said, with the flat light images, the cloudy images, you might have to do a bit more post-processing, but if I'm going in the field and I'm gonna be away from home where I, I have you know, a limited time where I'm traveling, I'll take overcast conditions any day of the week. So here's an example of, this is a horned grebe. This was shot in Canada, but it was at the very end of the day on a gloomy, gloomy overcast day. You wouldn't necessarily know from looking at this photo, but this is what the raw looked like. Um, I did what I needed to do in the field. If I had pushed the exposure any more to the right, I would have blown out little bits of his little tufts there. It may not look like it on your screens, but trust me, they're right on the edge of blowing out. But with a little bit of post-processing, you can make a really beautiful image still. So that's a really dramatic example from like pretty bad light 
to still being able to create something nice. Now, so we've talked about uh, direct low angle sunlight, we've talked about overcast light, and we the one sort of type of light that we haven't talked about yet is artificial light. And of course, by that, I mean flash. Um, fill flash or flash is not essential to good bird photography, by no means is it essential, but it can open up some doors and some interesting possibilities from, you know, just as little of a thing like it was mentioned of just adding a catch light to filling in a little bit of shadows and then some interesting creative possibilities to using flash that I like to do, we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but what happens to a lot of people, myself included, is you go and purchase a flash, you stick it in the hot shoe of your camera, and you go out and you take a picture of a bird, and it looks like the bird got blasted with the car headlights, and it looks super artificial and not very appealing at all, and you're not sure what to do, take a few more pictures, they look just as bad, you put the flash away and you don't ever use it again. It's really important to know that if we're going to use flash for wildlife photography, or especially for birds, is it's super important that we have to understand how to control the power of the flash. And in order to do that, we need a good way of knowing how much is enough, how much is too much. What I usually tell folks that I'm with in the field is a really good way, this is going to be hard with my hand and the zoom and everything, and the light in here is not natural light, but just imagine if you're outside, normally your hand is going to have a gradient of light. The sun is hitting the top of your hand and underneath your hand. If you're in your room right now, you can probably, if you have overhead lighting, if you do it, you probably see a gradient to light from the light hitting the top of your hand to a shadow underneath. Now, if you take a picture of even a branch just to get your flash set up, or of course a bird, and you've completely eliminated that gradient of light, meaning that the, the light underneath the bird is the same as the light on top of the bird, well then you're using too much flash. You've eliminated the natural shadows. You need a way to turn it back down. So what we use is called flash exposure compensation, just like your exposure compensation, but it's just for the flash. So we would turn the power of the flash down, try again, take a look. Now it looks a little better, but maybe it's still a bit too much. Dial it back a bit more and now you're good to go. So just understanding how to control the power is so important. The other thing that's really important for a nice natural looking flash image is to get the flash up out of the hot shoe and ideally up and off the camera. The reason this is so important is that <clears throat> when you take an image of a bird with the flash in the hot shoe, the light goes straight out, it hits the bird in the eye and it bounces straight back in your lens. And that tends to lead to what we call steel eye, where the bird's eye looks totally silver. Humans, I'm sure you've all experienced this, you take a picture of people and you get a red eye with flash. But birds get steel eye, so it looks very silver. It looks really bad, really artificial, and it's not that easy to clean up in Photoshop. You can definitely do it, but it's pretty annoying to have to deal with. So much easier is to get a flash bracket. I'll show you a photo of one later and get the, cam the flash up and off camera. So that's more or less what I want to say about flash for now. I lied. I'm going to say more about flash. So this is a little illustration of a few different scenarios, and we'll talk about how we would use flash. So the first one is the situation like I've been talking about, a nice, bright, overcast day. We've got the sloth in this case is in the shade, and the trees in the background are also in the shade or in the flat light. And in this situation, all we need is a little kiss of fill flash just to give a catch light and maybe a little fill in a bit of the dark shadows and some micro contrast on his fur really easy to handle, just a little kiss of fill flash. Now in the second one, we have the subject, the sloth is in the dark shade, very dark, and the background is in the sun. If we just took a picture here at the metered reading, we would basically have a silhouette. The, the background is so bright, it's gonna throw off the exposure and the camera is gonna to try to average out the exposure and that means the sloth in the shade is gonna be way too dark. So in this case, we'd have to hit them with quite a bit of flash to try to balance things out. Now in the third example, we have the, the opposite. So the sloth is being hit by the sun, the background is in the shade. And in this situation, flash is really not gonna help us because if we threw out a bunch of flash to try to hit the background, well, of course that would hit the subject too. And so that wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we don't really have the ability to balance this exposure. So we would be just going for a, a dramatic image. We would expose for the subject, the sloth, 
we'd make sure to expose to the right and not blow out anything of his fur or the branch. And the background would be dark and that's just, that's, that can look great. That can be a really dramatic, cool image. By the way, these um, figures are from one of my eBooks. This is, these are the ones we've seen so far are from the Guide to Tropical Nature Photography, just if you were wondering. Um, okay, so the other thing we wanna say about flash is that most of the time, we'll probably be using it in what's called ETTL mode. ETTL stands for electronic through the lens. But it is good to know that there's also manual mode of flash and we can change it into manual mode if we need to. But most of the time, most nature photographers are gonna be using TTL or ETTL. So what does that mean? Well, in, in TTL mode, what's happening when you take a picture is the, the camera and the flash are sending out a little pre-flash that hits the subject, bounces back through the lens, TTL, and then the camera meters off of that and decides, okay, I'm gonna send out this much flash. And it's smart. It's depending on how close you are. It's depending on what you're actually pointed at. Imagine if it's a very bright subject versus dark subject. It's taking all of that into consideration. Manual flash is not smart. Manual flash is just, you tell it what power, it puts out that power. It, has, it is not metering off of anything. It's just, you put in a power, it's putting that out there. So in our example here, in our illustration, we see that in the first call or the first row where we're closer to the subject, we've decided in the TTL case that we want the metered flash amount minus three stops. So we wanna to tone the flash down a bit just to provide some fill flash. So when we're really close, the flash meters and provides minus three stops. When we move further away, the flash still meters, it would be more because we're further away, but it then still knocks it down by three stops. In the manual example, when we're really close, very close to our subject, we'd have to really turn the flash down or it would be too much. And if we backed way up and we used that same amount of flash, it wouldn't even hit the subject. So we'd have to really turn the flash power up. The reality in the field like this is that you don't have time to play around with manual flash most of the time. Because if you're fiddling around taking test shots, flashing, 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 let's be honest, the bird is probably gonna fly away. And most of the time you're gonna be using ETTL flash. There are some times though, uh, imagine for example, that the rare and mystical ivory-billed woodpecker came and landed on a branch up against a bright white sky and you had the, duty to capture the only image of this bird in existence and you took a, a picture and the flash wasn't really doing enough so you thought okay well I'm in ETTL I'm going to turn the flash up to plus three stops and you take another picture shoot it's still not enough flash well maybe if the sky was so bright the flash might have the pre-flash might have metered at you know the minimal minimal amount of flash like one one twenty eighth power so even if you turned it up three stops, that would be a 64th, a 32nd, a 16th power at plus three stops. But for something like that up against a really bright white sky, that's probably still not a lot. So in a situation like that, where you really need a lot of flash, that's the main reason why you might quickly switch over to manual, get your ivory build woodpecker photo. Maybe you have to put out half power flash or full power flash in order to get some detail. But 99% of the time, you're going to be shooting in TTL flash. Now, I think that is all I want to say about flash, but your take home message is learn to control the power, get it up out of the hot shoe and off the camera. And most of the time, you're going to be using TTL. Okay, so that's all I have to say about flash for now. So we're going to move on now to composition. I find that composition is kind of one of those funny words. There's lots of words that are kind of funny like this. And you say them enough times and you kind of forget, like, what does that even mean, composition? So I kind of like to rephrase it and think that maybe one of the things that composition means is like a well-balanced image, something that's visually appealing to look at. And that, you know, the elements of the photo, including negative space, balance themselves out to make a pleasing image. That's what I think of when I think of composition. Now there's some rules. There's always rules. Um, you know, with wildlife, we tend to put more space in front of the bird or the subject. Could be also for other types of wildlife, people as well. 
there's rule of thirds, there's golden mean, there's all kinds of crazy rules. Um, one of the things that's always interesting to think about is does the subject look better maybe as a vertical or a uh, portrait type of image, or does it look better as a horizontal or a landscape type image? And I find in the field that a lot of bird photographers kind of can tend to neglect this, even though if you're shooting with a big lens, you have a collar and you can just quickly rotate your camera to switch to vertical. But a lot of times people are just excited to get the bird in the frame and take a photo and that's that. But it is worth thinking about the aspect ratio of the image in terms of its composition. Now, with that said, these days, most of our cameras have a ton of megapixels. We're not shooting with three and four megapixel cameras anymore. Let's be honest. We probably have 20 megapixels with our cameras that we're using or more. And if we just shoot a little bit loose, just don't cram the bird in the frame, then you have space to crop for composition after the fact. And that's kind of what I tend to like to do. Like, it's nice when the bird is big in the frame, but give yourself a little space and then you can kind of make those decisions while sipping a tea or a cup of coffee at your desk later on. Now, there's no perfect composition. There's no ideal composition. There's infinite possibilities. So I'm only gonna show you a few photos here, but we'll talk about composition a bit more later maybe. This is kind of a really standard bird image composition. Um, this is a beautiful Ross's gull from way up north in the Arctic. Um, and it's just pretty standard, more space in front of the bird this sort of ice fog that's lifting up off the ice, maybe helping to balance the negative space and the birds kind of looking into the open space, very standard. Something like this, this is an evening grosbeak. Um, an image like this, what I wanted to point out was just that it's not just the main subject that's part of the composition, but this image is really, it's really helps to balance this image with that little upper uh, sprig of, of fur that's poking into the corner. That really balances this image out and really helps the composition in my opinion. So we're not gonna, not gonna drone on about composition, but we'll move on now to sharpness. We all know that everybody, every wildlife photographer, every bird photographer is obsessed with sharpness. And of course, the most important thing to be sharp and in focus is the subject's eye. It's, it's, it's very important, let's be honest. The, the reason it's very important is that when you look at a good wildlife photo, you want that connection. You wanna feel like the subject is looking back at you. You're looking at the subject, it's looking at you. And that provides that connection in order to sort of make you interested in actually looking at the photo. If the eye is not in focus, unless it's some very artistic, license being taken with the photo, it's probably not gonna be a compelling image. So it is very important. Now, here's one of those times where I'm gonna throw it out to you guys. There's a lot of things that can lead to a sharp photo. What do you guys think some of those key things that could lead to a sharp photo might be? Hit your space bar and jump on in. Which focus point you're using? Yeah, definitely. So depending on what's going on, um, moving your focus point around in order to get it very accurate, or depending on if it's movement, what actual focus mode you're using definitely could contribute to your success. Any other thoughts? Depth of field. Yep. Yeah, so depth of field is not like essential to take a sharp photo. You can take, of course, razor sharp images wide open with a f2.8 lens, but you'll be very limited in how much of the image will be in focus. Um, and I'm sure you guys probably know this, but the closer you are to your subject, the less depth of field you have at a given aperture. So if we're shooting with a big telephoto lens and we're very close to our subject, while it might seem like we'd have a lot of depth of field at f5.6 or f8, if we're very close, that's actually really not a lot. Um, so yes, that is definitely worth considering. What else? What if I'm shooting with a big super telephoto lens in the dark rainforest and I'm trying to hand hold? Shutters. <laughs> ISO. ISO and leading, leading to a sufficient shutter speed. I think you guys maybe comboed the right answer there. Let's take a look. We got some good ones there. Let's take a look at my list. 
So I put down, are you stable? So again, using a big telephoto lens, I shoot probably 90, other than flight shooting, I'm pretty much always on a big sturdy tripod. I put, are you stabilized? So most, a lot of our lenses now have image stabilization or vibration reduction. And it's amazing. It, it, it really helps. Um, I put down good glass. I mean, it's a, unfortunately it's a reality that there's a quite a considerable difference between a $500 lens and a $15,000 lens, just the way it is. Um, we talked about shutter speed being adequate. And I put some other things here too. Sometimes, especially with a big telephoto lens, they have the, you know, those huge lens hoods. And if the wind, like it's blowing outside my house right now, is blowing into your lens hood, it is very difficult to take a sharp photo. Um, if you're at a really slow shutter speed, even the mirror flipping up in your camera can be enough to vibrate the camera enough to create movement and a non-sharp photo. One of the most frustrating things in the field when it happens is heat haze. Um, and it can happen when you wouldn't really expect it. I find the worst heat haze I've ever had is always up in the tundra, up in the far north. The sun beats down on the cold ground just enough to heat it up and have those little shimmering waves. And it becomes actually impossible to take a sharp photo. Um, super frustrating when that happens. So lots of things that can lead to a sharp or not sharp photo. I said the last point here is that, as I said, sharpness is super important. Of course, it's important that the subject is in focus, but I find that a lot of beginner wildlife photographers, they think it's the only thing that's important and they forget about everything else. And if the photo is not tack, 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 razor sharp, it's a throwaway and they neglect all these other things. So I would say if I had a photo that had like all seven of those elements, and wasn't tack sharp, but was in focus, I would still, you know, consider that a success. So just, it's important, but don't, it's not the only thing that's important. It's just what I wanna hi highlight. So here's a photo. Um, I just wanted to put this in here for two reasons. One, it shows the flash bracket that I was mentioning earlier. So notice how high my flash is up off the camera. It's not in the hot shoe, it's way higher. So my flash reflection is gonna bounce off the bird and then way off axis. The, the reflection is not gonna bounce back through my lens and be in my photo. Um, so that's really good to do. The other thing I wanted to just show is a technique. If you do use a big, a big lens and a gimbal head, I really like this technique of sort of pinching, pinching the gimbal arm. A lot of manuals and uh, reference material will suggest to put your hand out on your lens but for extended periods of time, I find this very uncomfortable and it hurts my back. And so this I find works much better for most people. Okay, we're on to our next essential element, which is the perch. Which could, no... could you say that again about the pinching? Sure, I'll go back one here. So you can see in the inset photo there, basically what I'm doing here is I'm setting my hand on the little knob. This is a Wimberly tripod head. And I'm just using my thumb and my index fin finger to pinch the swinging arm. It gives me so much stability. And I, when I'm tracking a moving subject, I can just move it around so easily. And because I'm kind of like, it's like, imagine if you're, I don't, I've never, I don't shoot anything. I've never shot a gun, but I know people have a certain stance they use that's very close to their body and very um, supported so that they can be accurate. And it's kind of the same idea here. The, the tighter and closer we are, we're, we're a little bit more stable, I think, and much more comfortable. Okay, so we're on to the perch now. So I put here that a good perch takes sort of a good photo to the next level. And in my opinion, a perch, the perch should be considered almost as important as the subject. For me, you know, when I'm going out in the field, whether it's here at home or down in the tropics, my goal is to hopefully try to create some of the best photos that have ever been taken of those birds. And that's just not possible if you're taking them on crappy perches, like boring looking branches, really big chunky things, man-made things. Those are never gonna yield exceptional photos. So the perch is super important. It, it, can, it, it needs to be of an appropriate size. Ideally, it adds something that's visually interesting to the image. 
taking it to the next level, maybe the perch actually suggests something about where the bird lives, gives us a clue about the bird's biology or behavior. And as we saw with that evening gross beak shot, the perch can actually help us out with our composition as well. So let's take a look at some examples. So this is a cool species of jay. This is actually down in Bolivia. And the reason I wanted to put this one is not necessarily the mossy perch that he's on, but actually the second element, I'm calling it, that, that branch that's up above the bird that really, in my opinion, helps to frame out the image and is, in my opinion, what makes it a more interesting photo. It gives you a clue. He lives in the rainforest. It's very mossy. Um, in this image, obviously, I'm wanting to um, highlight the fact all these beautiful berries that I think, again, are making the image more beautiful, but it also tells you something about the bird. Obviously, this bird likes to eat berries. That's kind of interesting. It's a lot going on in the background, but it's all kind of pleasantly um, balancing out in the image. Here's an image with, you know, this sort of more standard blurred out background, but to me, it's those extra elements, those leaves in the top that really help to fill out the composition and create a much more pleasing overall image. This is a, a very similar story of this Canada warbler, but really what I wanted to mention here is these Canada warblers, when they come to their breeding territories, they pretty much like to be in really wet coniferous forests with trees like tamaracks. And so obviously a tamarack is an ideal perch to show that behavior and the sort of life cycle of this bird. In this image, what I wanted to show, this is a, a swallow-tailed hummingbird from Brazil. And what I wanted to talk about here was that sometimes you can modify the perch. So this guy, this was near a, a hummingbird feeder, and this guy kept coming back and landing on, you know, a piece of rebar or whatever was there that, you know, obviously wasn't going to look great in a photo. Beautiful bird, not such a great perch. Hummingbirds, however, are very habitual. They'll, you know, really regularly go back to the same perch. So if you if you watch them, you might notice that they keep going back to the same spot. And by doing that here, I was able to just find a really beautiful perch. And I just took some tape and taped it on to the end of his little rebar. And sure enough, the next time he came back, he landed, he, he knew he wanted to go there and he landed right on my branch. And it's obviously a much more pleasing image than the rebar. Some would maybe consider this to be kind of like a messy photo, but to me, again, this is a, an orange-eared tanager from Peru. I love when nature, nature is messy. And when nature is messy in a photo, but it still kind of balances and doesn't detract from the image, I like that because it's, it's really easy to set up just boring stick, branch, bird, land on branch, perfectly green background. But what's not so easy is to, is to have this depth to the image. And when nature kind of gives you something that works, I'll, I'll take it every day. Another example, very similar. This is a scarlet-bellied mountain tanager. Again, he's feeding on these little white fruits. Lots going on in the background, but it gives you a good clue maybe as to where, what he likes to do. This is a hummingbird called an Ecuadorian hill star. And what's, what I wanted to point out here was, so this bird lives mostly only in Ecuador and it only feeds at this one type of shrub, the Chugirawa flower. So obviously a photo of this bird is extremely enhanced by it being on that, on that flower. Not only that, look what we have the depth of, in the image. So we have the perch that he's on, but then we have these nice ones kind of out of focus in the background. And that gives us a nice bit of depth to the shot, but they're not in the way. They're kind of just pleasing in the image. In this situation, we have this flycatcher. This is in Guyana. And if, if it was a tight shot of this bird just on such a big chunky perch, it maybe wouldn't be so interesting, but by shooting it a bit looser, and I think these leaves are quite interesting. They're, you know, kind of a funny shape. Some of them are coming off the tree. Some of them are, green, some of them are orange. I think it kind of balances the shot out quite nicely. Here we have another situation where I had to stage the perch. So this is a long-tailed sylph hummingbird in Ecuador. And he's got this crazy long tail. It's really tricky for composition. If you had a, just a perfectly straight horizontal branch, you wind up with this sort of awkward amount of negative space. So he kept landing in the same spot. So I gave him a nice diagonal to land on. And that I think helped a little bit. It would actually be even nicer if I had had a second element 
down in the bottom left. That would be even better. So some examples of purchase, obviously infinite possibilities, sky's the limit, but not to be neglected in your images, especially when you can set things up. So if you're shooting it in your backyard at a bird feeder, something like that, take, take half an hour and go walk around the forest, find some really cool branches and take your images to the next level. So now we're gonna talk about the background. Um, my first point here was the background should at least not distract from the image. So you could have uh, all the other elements of our photo with, you know, a pop can in the background or a car driving by or somebody photobombing you, and that's not going to help your photos. Better yet, the background could actually add to the photo. So while a nice blurred out green background, that can be pleasing and certainly lots of my images are like that. But even better would be something that tells us more of a story and tells us more about the natural history of the bird. If I'm going for a nice blurred out background, I tend to like the background to be a little darker than mid-tone, but um, that is probably my own bias because I shoot mostly in the rainforest, both at home and away. So I don't know, that point is maybe personal. So we're gonna look at a few backgrounds here. Again, lots of possibilities. Here's a very standard blurred out green background, certainly not detracting from this beautiful chestnut breasted coronet hummingbird, but it's not really adding a lot other than it's a pleasing color and, it's, and the bird pops out off of it and that's always nice. Now here we have a different hummingbird. This is a buff tailed coronet and he likes to feed a lot in the understory. And so I wanted a background that complemented the color palette of the subject of the image, the flower and the bird, didn't detract, but that complemented it and yet was kind of dark and moody. So in, in this situation, I, I think I really like the background. Now here again, we have like quite a busy scene, but this is what I was talking about. When nature's messy, but it still all looks nice, I love this kind of image because it maybe tells you, you can start to guess like, what is this weird bird doing. This is a strong build wood creeper in Ecuador. And maybe you get the sense that he might be looking for food in these sort of mossy trunks and bromeliads and epiphytes. He's looking for something to eat in there. And it kind of maybe helps to tell a bit more of a story than if he was just on a plain old stick. Again, here, some people would say, oh, it's well, a nice photo, but if I would prefer it to just be great, totally blurred out background. Well, I would disagree because this species of warbler lives only in the Caribbean and it only lives in pine forests. So to me, I wanted to suggest that habitat, but I don't think the background, while it's busy and kind of messy, it doesn't take away from the subject. And there's some really harmonious color palette going on with the bird's throat and the background as well, which maybe helps. Sometimes the background becomes the star of the show. So here we have a wimbrel up in the tundra and I happened to be there when all the flowers started to come into bloom. And so, you know, the background can be an amazing part of your image. Move my head out of the way. So we, it's usually in bird photography, the bird is relatively large in the frame, but when the opportunity presents itself to make like kind of like a bird scape where you're basically taking a landscape photo this is a black-bellied black plover way up in Nome. And I love this type of image because look at how much information it gives you about this bird. Where does this bird go to breed? Well, you can see its whole habitat. You get a sense of how close to the threshold of kind of life it goes all the way up to the north, right up to the snow line where it goes to make its little nest and, and raise its babies. And it just gives you so much information and tells a lot of a story. So. If, if, if you can have a pleasing image with the bird small in the frame, I think those can be really powerful. It's hard because in a more urban surrounds, it's, it's super hard to not have a fence or a hydro pole or somebody's house or whatever in the background. But when you're out in true nature and you have a beautiful overall scene, these can be like the best images. This is another example, very similar of basically what would be a nice landscape photo. And then this white-tailed ptarmigan kind of photobombed me and got in there. Um, 
but I love this style of image when, when, when everything sets up for it. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the pose. We'll talk a bit about some poses. Um, most important for a good pose, I think, is that you have eye contact. We've already talked about how important the eye is to the photo. So it's super important that you have some eye contact. And what tends to help that is to have a, the, the subject turning slightly towards the camera. So a little head turn. And the other thing I put here was maybe the pose might be indicative of that bird, like a classic pose for that particular bird. So this is a red-breasted sapsucker. And you know, his name is the red-breasted sapsucker. And look at this pose, like puffing out his chest, turning his head, just looking pristine. I mean, this is ideal pose for this bird. With woodpeckers or sapsuckers in this case, I love it when your um, perspective or your position relative to the bird allows you to have that little gap between the bird and the trunk of the tree. That means you're really perpendicular to the subject. And I think that that works really well. Um, so that's that guy. Here we have again, the buff-tailed coronet. And I can't take credit for this pose because these birds are flapping their wings 40 times a second. But I got lucky and the very complimentary wing pose to balance out the shot with the flower and the leaves. And they're slightly overlapping and it, it just kind of is a great pose to get for this type of a shot. Was that taken with a flash? Yeah, it is. Um, maybe in a little bit, I'll tell you guys a little bit more about this type of photography once we get into the X factor, if that sounds okay. Um, this is a bird called the giant ant pita. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they live in South America, but this is a very classic pose, very squat, very like a little understory chicken, very hard to photograph and very hard to get out in the open. So when you get a nice classic pose of a bird like this, it's even though it's not a, people probably want toucans and hummingbirds and parrots, but the, when you start going to the tropics a lot, these are the real stars because they're so hard to photograph these guys. In this one, you might look at this fiery throated hummingbird and think, well, he just, that's what he looks like. He always looks like this, but that would not be accurate. They, they, they flash this bright, um, red gorget but to actually capture an image of it you kind of have to be a little bit above the bird and they have to turn just the right angle so the pose for this photo was essential this is kind of a if you're familiar with nut hatches i'm sure if you guys have backyard feeders you probably get white breasted and red breasted nut hatches where you live and um, this is just such a classic nut hatch pose so sometimes the pose can just be very classic of a family of birds this is a, you know, kind of a showy pose. So this is a Cuban trogon. And if you're familiar with that um, family, they, these guys are the only ones that have this really crazy scalloped tail, but you don't always see it like this. It's only when they flare their tail, which they very rarely do. So I got super lucky here and he really showed off. So this, the pose really made this shot. All right, we've got through our seven elements. And now I'm going to throw it back out to you guys as what are some things that could be like an X factor? What are some things in addition to our seven elements that could take the photo up to the next level? What do you guys think? Hold the space bar down and give us some suggestions. Luck. Luck? <laughs> Always required. <laughs> what else? Beha behavior. Pictures that include behavior. That's a good one, Janet. I was just saying the same thing Jagger did, some kind of. We lost you, Jeffrey. Some kind of action the bird's engaged in, which, as Janet said, their behavior. Yeah, definitely. What else do you guys think? OK, we're going to go to my list. Can, can I ask you a question? For sure. Are, some of the images you have, it looks like the birds are almost engaging in a threat display, which is incredibly dramatic. Are they ever threatened and do you ever capture them that way? Or is that just sort of the bird's natural uh, behavior on it, its own? So that the one we just saw of the Cuban trogon was definitely a threat display because when I was there, another male bird flew in and came kind of close to this guy. 
and birds are very territorial. They, uh, or they can be, they don't, they're not always, but um, they can be very territorial. And so in this case, this guy, the reason he did that pose was to try to scare the other guy away. And I just happened to be there ready, to, ready to go. So back to the, the old luck came into play there. So let's see my list. So I put down obviously behavior like was suggested. I put down maybe with prey, um, some kind of action, maybe calling could be cool in a photo. Um, if they have their, their babies with them. So with sort of life history kind of thing can be great. Mating, if, if you're into that kind of photo. Um, extreme weather could be cool. Like there's, there's lots of options that could take an image up to the next level. So we're gonna look at some examples here. So behavior is always interesting. So this is a photo, um, when I first went to Costa Rica, I went to a place and I saw these hummingbirds that were pretty regularly, like at least like once an hour, coming to this little stream and diving down into the stream and bathing. And I just thought that was so cool to be able to sit there for a few hours and see several different species coming. Now at the time I didn't have the skill or the knowledge or the equipment or the patience to capture a great photo. But many years later, I was like, I wanna go back to that place. And I don't care what it takes, I wanna capture that photo. So I sat down by the stream for a week. I left to get food and whatnot, but I listened to many an audiobook and podcast and I just waited. And it was very difficult because it was so dark in order to try to autofocus or manually focus on the bird. Obviously it took some technique and setup and things, but I finally got some cool images of the birds coming out of the water from this very interesting behavior that I've really never seen anywhere else. Of course they bathe, but they usually do it in a very private way that, they, that you don't see it. So that was a cool X factor shot. It was just a kind of a cool action shot, this beautiful red and green macaw just banking, showing his beautiful colors, just a flight shot, but that can take it to the next level. A uh, bit of courtship display here. This is a common golden eye, kicking his feet up in the air, calling, um, trying to attract a mate. Feeding, so we've got an acorn woodpecker with an acorn, enough said. Different kind of feeding, good day for the Merlin, bad day for the Dowager. Good day for the wood creeper, bad day for the lizard. Here we have a beautiful golden crown kinglet really displaying, showing his crest, calling. Look at the appropriate perch for the type of forest that this guy lives in. Look at the pose. Look at the background, pleasantly blurred out of focus, but still has a little bit of texture. Look at the composition. You start to see how these seven elements are layering up and adding to a really nice photo. X factor could be something a little different. So here we have definitely a very different species. This is a red-billed scythe bill in Brazil. But what I really wanted to show you here is immediately when I saw this bird creeping up the trunk, I didn't want to overexpose and try to get detail on the bird. Instead, I was like, that's going to make a really powerful silhouette because look at that crazy bill. So I just went for the silhouetted shot and I think it's a much stronger shot than would have been by overexposing and having more detail in the, in the bird. So different technique. Here's another different technique. So in this case, we have the same species of red and green macaw that we saw earlier, but here I'm using what's called a pan blur technique. So I'm slowing my shutter speed way down and I'm trying to pan at the same speed as the bird is flying. By doing so, I get this nice blur in the background and a bit in the wings, but because I moved at the same speed as the bird was, the eye is still quite in focus. Extreme weather and kind of a cool setting. So we've got this beautiful snow falling with this king penguin looking out over all the babies, just kind of a cool, a cool scene. I told you to remember about the shadow trick. I told you to remember exposed to the right. And I'm gonna tell you that everybody loves baby ducks. Now, a uh, question a few minutes ago was about the uh, hummingbird photo. Was that taken with flash? 
And the answer is yes. Um, a technique that I really like to use for hummingbirds is what I call multi-flash hummingbird photography. Now, it would be great, like I said, if we could just have that spotlight to shine direct light on subjects anywhere we went. But most species of hummingbirds, I'm gonna, trivia time. Anyone can, can anyone guess how many species of hummingbirds there are in the world? I should know, but I don't. <laughs> Any Thousands. guesses? Thousands. Not thousands. Probably 600. Not that many either. There's about 360 species of hummingbirds in the world, which actually makes them the second largest family of birds. The only larger family is um, tyrant flycatchers. So they're a huge family of birds. They live only in the New World. So in North America and South and Central America, they don't live in Asia or Africa or Europe, Australia, only in the Americas. And most of them live in the tropical Andes. Like I told you guys before, shooting in the tropical Andes, the light can be very challenging. It's either too harsh or not enough at all. Most hummingbirds live in a sort of region known roughly as the cloud forest where it's often cloudy and you don't have super bright light to have fast shutter speeds to capture this kind of shot in natural light. So what do you do if you want to photograph hummingbirds? Well, I, want, I don't wanna say that I've developed this technique because people have been using flash to capture motion for long before I existed. But I do think that I helped take it to another level. Um, when there's, there's locations where there'll be hummingbird feeders and like hummingbirds will be coming with quite a lot of regularity. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll set up a flower near the hummingbird feeder and I'll set up some flashes around it and I'll also light a background. The reason why this is so advantageous is that I can light the whole scene. So I can, I'm not relying on natural light at all. If I took a picture and the flashes didn't fire, it would be almost black. The flash is providing almost all of the light in the scene. And because I can turn my flashes down to a very low power, they're firing for an extremely brief duration. It's like a 16,000th or an 8,000th of a second. And it's only that moment that the flash fires, that tiny pulse of light, only that moment, that 16,000 or 8,000 of a second that, that it shoots that light out, it's only that moment that's captured in the image because the rest of it otherwise would be black. The shutter can be open much longer. That doesn't matter because there's no natural light getting in. So it's only that little boop, that little pulse of flashlight that freezes the moment. And that's how I'm able to capture these hummingbirds like this that otherwise would just never be possible to get flight shots of them in the dark understory of the cloud forest. So different technique. So that, uh, that brings us to the end of part one, which is by far the longest part of this talk, all about our seven elements and our X factors. Um, and if no one has any really pertinent questions, I think I'll just keep going on ahead and we can go into questions at the end if no one has anything that they really wanna bring up. There's nothing in the chat. All right, let's keep going then. Next part is all about being a nerd and doing your homework. It's very important. I have always kind of been this way when it comes to my photography. Um, and I can tell you that I, th I think it's really led to my success when it comes to you know, flying halfway around the world to a far off country and having success with birds that I've never seen or heard before. Because when I get there, I'm prepared. I've done my research, I've done my homework and it really leads to success. So we're gonna look at a few different scenarios here. The first one is how would I prepare for a day's shoot? So let's just say tomorrow, I think I'm gonna go out shooting tomorrow morning. What would I do? Well. The first thing is, what do I want to, what do I want to photograph? So what species am I after? There's amazing resources now. Let's just say I want to just photograph a particular species of bird tomorrow. I would very likely go on a website called eBird. Perhaps you've heard of it. eBird kind of looks like this. This is in Australia, but that's, that's not relevant. When you punch in a species name, it shows you all these little pins, like these little blue pins. It tells you where have people recorded this bird before. The red pins means that it's, I believe, within the last week. So very recent sighting of that bird. There are 
hundreds of millions of eBird sightings. So it's a very, very, very popular and well-used site. So if you're thinking to yourself, you're looking through your field guide and you're thinking, hey, I would really love to photograph this species. You could put that species in and then see if anybody's seen it around your local neighborhood. Maybe there's a particular reserve where lots of people are seeing that species. Well, that would be a great first step to go to that reserve and then try to find the bird, right? So eBird is an amazing resource for trying to find birds. The next thing, which I think is super important, is to at least have a basic understanding of the bird's calls. I would say that when I'm in the field, I'm probably 75% with my ears and 25% with my eyes. It's my ears are by far my most important sense when it comes to finding and photographing birds. But in order for them to be helpful, I need to know what I'm listening for. So if I'm looking for a particular type of bird, the night before, I'm going to make sure that I listen to its call. There's some, you might be able to get an app on your phone if you have a, a smartphone, or you could go to the public library. They have often will have like a CD set, like a Birds of West, Birds of Eastern North America. You could get that for free and um, listen to them. Uh, online, there's an amazing website here I've put called Zeno Canto. And again, free resource where you can find tons of bird calls that you can listen to. So Cornell Labs. Sorry. Cornell, doesn't Cornell Labs yeah. and the Macaulay? Absolutely. Yeah. Cornell has the Macaulay Library, which has a tremendous library of calls. So yeah, there's tons of resources to, to start to learn some of the calls. Okay, so the next thing, night before the shoot, I'm gonna get all my gear out. I'm gonna make sure my batteries are charged. I'm gonna make sure I got a memory card in the camera. I'm gonna make sure I have all my bits and pieces laid out because maybe in the morning I'm a little groggy and I forget something important and then I get out to my park and oh shoot, I don't have a memory card or a battery. Forgot my tripod, you know? So put your gear out the night before, then wake up, wake up early. Get there early. You want to be there not when the light's getting good. You want to be there half an hour before the light is up so that you can get all your stuff out, get set up, and importantly, starting to listen for your target bird because birds call the most first thing in the morning, the dawn chorus, we call it. That's when you're going to be most likely to hear your bird calling is right at the very beginning. So maybe you get there early, you get set up, and you think, oh, I think I recognize that one and you walk around and you find out where he's singing from. Well, he might be singing from a territory. And if you just hang out there, you might have just dramatically increased your probability of getting a good photo of that bird. So then I said, make the magic happen. So as you get more experience, you learn about bird behavior, learn what they're likely to do. You start to learn, use all your techniques for getting close to things and you know, if you do all these things, you will increase your chances of success. Now, what about a project with a much bigger scope? So I've done some trips six months by myself in the tropics. How can I prepare a little, a young man from rural Canada to go down to Colombia for six months and have any kind of success? Well, it's a much bigger trip. I need to do a lot more research. So one of the things that I like to start with when I'm doing a big trip, I love this website. It's called Cloudbirders. And Cloudbirders is basically like a, a, a site where mostly bird watching tour companies post their trip reports. So the typical thing is like a bird watching tour company, they'll go on a trip somewhere and the trip leader at the end of the trip will prepare a trip report that says where they went, what they saw, all the stories, whatever. There's thousands of them on cloud birders. And so if you can just punch in where you want to go, and then you can see all these trip reports, you can read about, well, what types of places do people go to? Oh, well, that seems like a really nice place. Maybe on my trip, I'd like to go there. And you can start to pull out some really interesting information. Look at this again from Australia, but look at this, even this bar graph, look at the information there. If you were going to go on a once in a lifetime trip to Australia, would you so this is obviously showing the number of trip reports in a given month. Do you think that you would want to go in April or do you think you'd want to go in October? I would probably want to go in October when 
most of the trip reports are. That's obviously their spring. That's clearly the best time for these bird watching tour companies to go and look for birds. So huge amount of information before you even open a trip report and you can search it. It's, it's an excellent, excellent resource. So if you're going to go far and wide, or even like there's going to be trip reports for Eastern, Eastern North America as well. Like there's trip reports for everywhere. So if you want to dig in a little deeper, this is a great site. So for me, you know, I'm going to download a whole bunch of these trip reports. I'm going to start reading through them. I might print them out, highlight the key things, key birds I want to see, certain lodges and locations. I, I noticed these, this, everyone mentions this one place. Well, I better, you know, write that one down. I probably definitely want to go to that place. And before long, after reading through them all, I kind of have uh, gleaned out some inf interesting information. And what I always do is I make a, uh, for every trip I ever go on, I make a like a research document and each place that I'd like to go, like in this case, this is a, a lodge in Colombia, I'll make like a little summary. You know, these are the main birds that I'd like to see and photograph at this lodge. And then I make a list of kind of some of the features or things that I think would be interesting there. Like their feeding ant pit is there. They've got hummingbird feeders. Some people have seen some owls around at night and then they have these certain trails and I list like I'm just basically cut and pasting from the trip documents, what birds people have seen on these trails. But then let's say it's months later, like if I'm six going on a six month trip, it might be months since I've read these things. But the night before in my room, I can kind of like, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, I want to look for this guy tomorrow. Um, maybe I should listen to his call. Okay, yeah, all right, that's what I'm going to listen for tomorrow. So tomorrow, maybe I'm going to go out on the trails early. I'm going to listen for this bird. Then I'm going to come back. I'm going to go to the hummingbird feeders. And then at night, I'm going to go to the ant pit of feeders. So I kind of have a plan rather than just wandering around the forest by myself with no plan. I can tell you that this leads to better photos. And then, yeah, once I'm there, we basically bump back up to how we prepare for the day's shoot. So we get our stuff ready the night before. We listen to the calls, we get up early and get out there and we make the magic happen using our good techniques. So just, I don't know, I, it's maybe seems really obvious, but I pr probably count on one hand the number of bird photographers that I know that actually do this. So if you really wanna be successful, let's say you have a favorite bird that lives near you that you haven't had the opportunity to photograph, just try, try this technique in the spring, <laughs> ideally, probably not now, and oh, snowy owls snowy owl there you go yeah but yeah if if you if you just give this a try and and i think you'll find you'll have better results glenn um the calls that call uh xeno canto is that a app for your phone or is that on the computer so it's just a website and it's xeno canto dot it's not dot com it's dot org uh, if you Google Zeno Canto bird calls, it'll for sure come up or Zeno Canto birds, that will definitely get you there. But it is, I don't even know, I don't know how many bird calls are on there, but I'm going to guess millions. I mean, there's so many. It's right up there with Macaulay Library, and I would say much more accessible. With Macaulay, you often, if you want to actually download the calls, you have to email them and they send them to you. Whereas with Zeno Canto, it's much, much, much easier to describe them. So definitely check it out. All right, so we're on to part three now, a uh, pretty short little part here. It's all about, we've kind of talked about some of these things now, um, but once we're in the field, again, we just want to keep it simple out there. We want to strip away all the extra things that could get in our way. And we want to just be really focused on the result of getting a good photo. So we talked about already average day in the field. We want to be out there at first light. Of course, if it's a morning shoot, if it's an afternoon shoot, that I guess I'm, what I'm saying is you probably get out there while your shadow might still be a little short and then get all your stuff ready and get to a nice part of the forest or wherever you're shooting. And then by the time you get there and you're ready, the light's getting good. I think most people are going to find that if they're target focused, they're going to have better results. So there's times when you just wander around looking for any odd bird, but at least domestically, I would say that if you go out with a, a target or a few targets in mind, you're gonna have more success. As we've talked about, we're guided by our ears. So we've listened to the calls and we're listening for the birds. You're gonna be way more successful finding them if you can hear them and you know what you're hearing. 
And of course, if you try to go out and photograph, if you say, oh yeah, I'm going to try for these 25 birds today. Well, maybe you have a really magical ear and a great memory and you can remember all those in one night. But more realistic maybe would be to go for just a couple as you're learning the calls if you don't already know them. And as you keep practicing, you'll learn more and more and you'll start to memorize them. Sometimes in nature, we start to notice patterns. So maybe we're out, we're looking for a particular bird. And we start noticing though, that this particular tree, lots of birds seem to be flying in and out of it. And then we look closer and oh, look, it's got some little fruits or berries. Hmm. I was gonna go after that other bird, but you know what? Maybe I'll just camp out here for half an hour and see if I can get a really cool shot of a bird coming in here and eating berries, just an example. We're always looking for patterns in nature. Anything that can become, anything that can tip the scales in our favor of predictability is always worth paying attention to. Um, and remember your shadow trick. So you're out in the morning, you're having a great morning, having some success, getting some good photos. Temptation might be to just keep it going, keep staying out there, but you look down at your shadow and it's shorter than your body, pack it up, go get a drink, take a little break, listen to some more bird calls, make a plan for the afternoon and get out there again once the light's good again. Uh, bird photographers, they like their gadgets. I've been in the field with many hundreds of aspiring photographers and they love gadgets. Some gadgets are cool and can really help you to take better photos, but you don't want to have every gadget, not everyone. You don't wanna be like this guy. This will not help you take pictures of birds. So what I like to say is keep it simple, just bring what you need and stay organized out there. So this is pretty much every time me in the field. I just have my tripod with my big lens rigged up, flash bracket, everything's ready to go. It's on my shoulder, tripod's already out. If I see a bird, I'm ready. I've got my binoculars, of course. That's very helpful for finding them. And I very rarely will have a backpack with anything important in it because if, let's say, my battery starts to go flat or my memory card fills up because something really amazing is happening and I have to take off my backpack. Oh, well, shoot, my binocular straps over my backpack. Take this off. Take this off. Zip, 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 zip. Where's my memory card? Take it out. Put it up. Oh, bird's gone. Much, much, much better is either some people like a vest or something, something that has your important things right in front of you. I'm all about the fanny pack. I can fit so much stuff in that thing. I have my memory cards, my batteries, I have bug spray, I have sunscreen, I have a bottle of water, I have my flash, I have my teleconverter, I have a headlamp, I have a laser pointer. I have so much stuff in there and it's all right where I need it. And I can get my teleconverter and slap it on the lens in 15 seconds. So just, when you're talking about field photography, where you're out walking around looking for birds, trying to locate them, you really only want the stuff that you need and you want the stuff you need accessible in order to be successful. Let's see, where are we here? Oh yeah, okay. So another thing I like to think is like, it's really important to have realistic goals. So some people think like every time Glenn goes out, he gets 20 great shots. Wrong. Very, very wrong. Sometimes on a great day, maybe, but very often you don't get any good shots. I'm always happy in the field. If I, if every time I go out, if I get like one good photo from a morning shoot, I'm happy. Like if every time I go out, I get a good photo, I'm happy. So just have realistic goals out there. And I think that it can be demoralizing if you think like oh what's what am I doing wrong everybody else is getting all these great photos and you know I only sometimes get a great photo well just keep it realistic with that said sometimes you have some things in your favor so maybe you're in your backyard you got a bird seed going on some suet the birds are coming to you you can wait for perfect nice light you got your camera set up, you got your cup of coffee, everything's great. In those situations, take the extra time to do it right. Like I said, go find a great perch, maybe even the day before. Go look around, find a beautiful perch with some cool moss on it or neat bark or nice leaves or, you know, maybe it's a woodpecker that has like some crazy bark and like a 
piece of fungus growing off of it. Like find something that actually is visually appealing. Set it up at the right distance. Leave yourself some space to crop. You know, try to put all those seven elements together and take the time to put it all together and get a great shot. Don't just force the issue. What I see so often is we'll show up to this lodge, you know, with let's say one of my photo tours and there's all these spectacular birds zipping around coming to the feeders. Of course, they're not set up at all for photography and people are just taking pictures of these hummingbirds sitting on a giant mango or a tanager or whatever, sitting on a mango. And I'm like, guys, give me 10 minutes, go set up your room, go get unpacked. Give me, give me a little bit of time. And they come back and then there's this beautiful mossy perch there. And then we can really start to get to work and get some great shots. So just take all your seven elements, make it all come together. So now we're going to talk a little bit about building a portfolio because it's not, you can do all those things right, but there's a few things I guess I want to say here. The most important is there's no one right type of image. There's no perfect type of image. There's no correct type of image. There's lots of beautiful types of images. And what's most important to you or to me or to any photographer is to think about what are you trying to create? What gets you excited about being out in nature and with your camera? What is like the night before a photo shoot where you're thinking in your, in your mind, like, oh, I really hope I see this bird or tomorrow I'm really hoping I can get this type of shot. So it's so important to think about what do you wanna do? What are you trying to create? But maybe you don't know because you're new to bird photography and you're not really sure like what makes a great photo, I don't know. So maybe a good idea is to study lots of images from people who maybe are like critically acclaimed. Maybe you look at the wildlife photographer of the year competition. Maybe you go online, maybe you have National Geographic's, maybe you have a bunch of bird books, Instagram, whatever. Find some inspiration and start looking for photos that you like. And it doesn't matter what they are, just what do you like about, about images? Then you can start to visualize things. So you start to think about before you go into the field, what am I going for? What am I trying to create? For me, what, I, what gets me excited, I wanna capture beautiful portraits of spectacular birds in their natural habitat that show these birds more beautiful than people are used to seeing them. So they really show the best side of a bird and that people want to go see those birds. You look at that photo, you're like, I want to see that bird. And in a portfolio though, I don't want only one type of image. So here we have a little example. We're going to talk about this a little bit. You know, we have a nice uh, perched image with some flowers. We have this other very different type of habitat. We have a tight portrait. We have a flight shot. We have a multi-flash shot. And we have a very different setting, obviously, of a tropical bird. So we have a variety of sort of types of images. So I kind of mentioned some of this stuff. So I'm looking often for species diversity and definitely different styles of images. I put here the book factor. So for example, right now I'm working on a, a book with Princeton University Press all about hummingbirds. And I'm super excited about it. It's gonna be out by next Christmas. So there's my plug. If you see my hummingbirds book, it's a good Christmas present next year. Um, but I don't want 300 pages of multi-flash hummingbird, multi-flash hummingbird, multi-flash hummingbird, multi-flash hummingbird. By page 50, you might kind of be like, okay, yeah, I get it. All right, yeah, he's got a technique, he does it. Yeah, it looks cool, fair enough. I'm always thinking like about the book factor. So what would keep you turning pages? Different types of images, close-ups, perch shots, flight shots, natural light shots, artificial light shots, something different figures, charts, graphs, interesting text. Like I want, I want you to not know what's coming and want to keep flipping the pages. That to me is my goal as a sort of professional photographer. So that I think is really important for me, maybe not for you, but I think the book factor for me is really important. This next section is maybe a little bit obvious. So I'm going to flip through it pretty quickly, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about with two different portfolios. So here we have portfolio A. We've got a beautiful yellow warbler. He's on a nice perch. He's got a green background. Now we have a beautiful blue gray tanager. He's on a nice looking perch and he's got a green background. We've got a beautiful Cape May warbler. He's on a nice perch. He's got a nice green background. 
beautiful uh, chlorophonia. Again, nothing wrong with that perch, nothing wrong with that background, nice and green. Here we've got an Arctic warbler, he's singing, you know, green background. Beautiful redneck tanager, nice perch, green background. And we've got a keel build toucan with a cool perch and a green background. Nothing wrong with any of those shots, but do they make a great portfolio? Forgot about that one, he's in there too. Okay, now we have portfolio B. Right out of the gate, we've got a nocturnal shot of a saw wet owl. Ooh, I wonder how he took that shot at night. I wonder if he used flash. Now we've got a beautiful tight portrait of this spectacular wood duck. Hmm, I wonder what that guy's eating. Hmm, maybe it's a salmon egg. Ooh, I, look at those lichens on the perch. I wonder if this guy lives in the rainforest. Wow, look at that flight shot. Ah, I wonder what kind of shutter speed he was using for that. Ooh, look at the iridescence on that bird. Wow, look at that guy. Looks a little backlit. I guess the light was shining through there. I wonder what this bird sounds like. Whoa, what's that guy doing? Some kind of crazy dance. Pretty obvious what I'm trying to get across there. It's kind of a rhetorical question. But I think when you're creating a portfolio of images, let's just say, for example, that you were going to make like a little photo book, try to pick a variety of different styles. And when you're out in the field, it's good, it's good to learn a technique, but it's good to try different things. So circle back around to looking at lots of different types of images, look at the ones that you like and try to think, well, how did they do that? So maybe it's the nice blurred out green background that you're going for. Okay, how would they do that? Well, we need to isolate the subject from the background. So we need a bit of distance between the subject and our background. We need a relatively long telephoto lens and that's probably the most important elements for that type of shot. So just deconstruct the photo and try to get different types. The other thing I put in here, I feel like I've been very outcome driven for this talk. And I, I think that is important. Of course, you're, I'm a professional, it's my job. I wanna take nice photos, but I'll tell you this. If bird photography was just sitting in a blind, staring at a feeder and waiting for a bird to land on my perch, I wouldn't do it. It would not be interesting enough for me. For me, of course I want a good photo, but the reason that I love bird photography is that it's a great excuse to get out in nature, get some exercise, have some cool adventures, see different parts of the world, meet cool people, smell different things, taste different things. It's just a vessel to get out there. So I've, you know, I've, again, I've stumbled across a lot of different types of photographers and I, I get it when you're super outcome driven, but it's important to always stop and smell the roses out there too. Okay, so we're going to move into the digital darkroom now. Obviously, the scope of this presentation, I can't get hugely in depth in Photoshop, but I do want to touch on that we are digital photographers. The digital darkroom is an important aspect of digital photography. There are still people that will come across and say, ah, oh, Photoshop is cheating. Can't do Photoshop. I think you're missing out if that's your take. So there's a huge spectrum of how much you want to do to your photos. Hopefully, if you get serious about taking nature images, you're going to want to shoot raw. And it might be that you simply convert your raw photos into a usable format. Maybe that's where you stop, but that's still the digital darkroom. Maybe you want to do more. We can talk a little bit about that. But before you get started with anything, it's so important that you calibrate your monitor. And by this, if you're not familiar with this, what I'm talking about is getting a calibration device. You stick it on your monitor. It's going to come with some software. It's going to run through a whole bunch of colors and shades, and it's going to tell your computer how to display the colors correctly on your monitor. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because imagine that Janet has an uncalibrated monitor and she's fiddled around with the saturation and the contrast and the brightness, and she thinks it looks, it looks great. So she processes all her bird photos and then she sends them over to me and I go, holy, Janet needs some new glasses because her photos look crazy on my photos, on my screen. Or Janet sends them in, sorry to pick on you, Janet. She sends them off to the photo lab and expecting what she sees on her screen. And all of a sudden they come back and they're way oversaturated, too contrasty, 
and she's dis disappointed at her prints. Well, it could be that the photo lab is not very good, but in order to feel confident in what you're doing, it's really important you calibrate your screen. So if you haven't done that, make sure you get a device. They're not super expensive. Maybe you know a photographer who you can borrow one from in a COVID, COVID friendly way. And you know, you could you could just, it only takes 15 minutes to calibrate your screen. They'll tell you, the software will tell you you need to do it every two weeks. You don't. You could do it twice a year and that will be just fine. So get calibrated. The next thing that I want to point out before we get into processing is bird photographers, we take a lot of photos. If things are happening and birds jumping around or flying or doing something cool, it's not uncommon to take like 2,000 photos in a day. We, we often have cameras that can shoot at a high frame rate, maybe 10 plus frames a second. So if you take, if you go out for a shoot and you take 2000 photos, you have got to have an effective, efficient way of going through those images and picking out the best ones and getting rid of the bad ones. Many, many, many people don't bother doing this. They just get home. They kind of look through them a bit. They get a little bored. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. They pull a few out and maybe they process them. But how do you know those were your best ones? So I think it's so important to have a good program for culling. Now, if you're on a PC platform, my absolute favorite is this program called Breeze Browser. It's a phenomenal program for culling. It is unfortunately not available for Mac. Um, but for, for PC users, it is the best. It's not super expensive and it is instantly loads the thumbnails. And best of all, you can zoom in very quickly to see, to compare four different images. So, you know, if you're a bird photographer, you know, you often shoot a whole bunch of shots. They're very similar. You can clearly tell the ones that are, excuse me, totally out of focus, but you get to a point where you're like, well, is that one better or is that one better? And you really want the best one. So this program allows you to quickly zoom in and say, okay, I want to keep number two. So I'm going to delete number one, number three, and number four. And as you go through, you can really quickly rip through a folder of images. The other thing I use Breeze Browser for is batch renaming my photos. So before I move into the raw processing, I'll always rename my files really quickly. So I'll select all of a certain species. If I was only photographing one species, then that's as simple as Control A, selecting all the files. And then there's a keyboard shortcut or you could right click, batch rename, type in the species name and boom, they're all renamed for me, it takes five seconds. If there's a whole bunch of different species, I might have to select them and you know, use either command or control to add to my selection. And then anyways, we won't get into detail about battery naming, but it's very simple. You can rename all your photos. And that way, once we go in to start processing the raw files, we know that we have just our best work, our very best photos, they're renamed for us. And the other thing that renaming does is it kind of gives you a good clue of maybe you're still keeping too many. I tell people, delete at least 90% of what you shoot, at least 90%. I probably delete 98% of what I shoot. I only want the best ones. I don't wanna be spending my whole life in Photoshop, but I do wanna select my best images and spend the time necessary to polish them up to be the best they can be. So we wanna we want to get calibrated. We wanna delete all the bad ones. And then we want to establish, remember, the, the moral of this talk is all about simplified. We want bird photography simplified, digital darkroom simplified. So we want to just have a nice set of steps that we do on all of our images. So for me, I always will process my raw files, and then I'll move into sort of a certain set of steps in Photoshop, and then I'll address specific concerns. Now, when it comes to processing the raw files, the last thing we want to do is to just open up one photo, process it in RAW, then process it in Photoshop, and then save it, and then come back and grab another RAW file, and then move on through. Now, if this is sounding familiar, much, 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 much better is, remember, we renamed our files. So let's just say that you went down to the local pond, and you were photographing some ducks all morning, and the ducks were all swimming around and the light was staying more or less the same. You were in the same spot. You had different species, but more or less, conditions weren't changing dramatically. So 
Better yet would be we open up all the photos we kept. So if we took if we took 100 photos that morning or a thousand, let's say we took 100 photos, we're going to only keep 10%. So we've got our 10 duck photos. We're going to open them all up in, I use Adobe Camera Raw, but maybe you use a different raw conversion program. And there's a huge time efficiency to processing that first photo, adjusting all of our raw settings how we would like. And then remember, not much changed. We were in the same light, same setting. So we can just take those settings and apply them to the other nine photos. Or maybe we were processing 50 photos. So we're doing the first one and we apply those settings. That's in Adobe Camera Raw, it's called syncing your settings. Now that doesn't mean that those settings will be perfect, perfect for all those other photos, but it probably got you 90% of the way there. And you can save so much time by kind of batch processing your raw files like that. So we do that and we spit them all out. What I do is I, let's say I was out shooting in the morning and then I took 500 photos. I only kept 25 of them. I open them all up in Adobe Camera Raw and I'm just spitting all those, I'm converting all the raw files into TIFF files. I'm not opening one and then processing it all the way through. So when I'm converting them, I'm outputting them to a folder on my computer that I call images to process. So all of my images that my raw files that have been converted, they all go into images to process. That's my kind of holding tank. I know that those ones, I've converted the raw, but I haven't polished it up in Photoshop yet. So they're there waiting for me. Once I'm done with the raws, I could go ahead in there and open up a few or maybe just one TIFF file and then polish it up in Photoshop. And if I get busy or if I go off on another trip, I know that those ones are still there waiting for me. They're not lost in some folder on my hard drive never to be seen again. They're waiting there ready to polish up. Once we get into Photoshop, I love using actions to save time. If you're not familiar with Photoshop and Photoshop actions, an action is like a little recipe, or if you know like computer technology, it's like a macro. So basically you can record an action. It's a series of steps that you kind of do on a regular basis. And then when you play that action, it'll walk you through them much quicker. It's not automatically processing your photo, doing the same things. It still will allow you to slide the sliders and change the things, but it'll automatically open that next thing that you want to use on a regular basis. So I have sort of five or six steps that I always do on every photo to help me polish it up. And the action saves me so much time doing it. Once I've done those things, what I would call global concerns, so things that affect the whole image, then I'll move into specific concerns, local things. So maybe, for example, um, there's a little branch that I want to get rid of. Or maybe I wanted to, maybe I got like an extra catch light from the flash that I wanted to get rid of or somebody else's flash, things like that. So specific things that I need to look at. And then I would save the file and move on to the next one. So use actions to, to stay on track and save time. As we develop our basic Photoshop workflow, Photoshop can be so daunting. You open that program and you're like, where do I even start? Look at all these things, filters, tools. I don't even know where to start. But if you just develop a very basic workflow, then you can add to that. You can, that can get you most of the way there. And then as you get more comfortable, maybe you watch a YouTube video, I'll do a plug for my own products in a second here, but you can keep adding to your skill set. Just like, just like a carpenter would add tools to his arsenal, as does the Photoshop user. You can slowly add to your collection of tools. What I like to tell people that I work with is you want to become proficient, but also efficient. So I love it when I'm teaching people Photoshop and I show them something and the light bulb goes off like, oh my God, I've been wasting so much time the way I've been doing it. I just love that because I feel like there's certain things you can do that just speed it up. And it doesn't mean that you're doing a, a worse job. You're still getting an exceptional result. You're just learning ways to speed up that process. So you can do some other stuff, go out shooting more, watch your favorite Netflix show, pet your cat, whatever. But we, nobody wants to just waste time on the computer, let's be honest. Um, and like I said, there's a spectrum of processing. Maybe you just convert the raw file and adjust the contrast and then save it. That's fine, no worries. But maybe you wanna go a little further and that's great too. They're your photos, do what you want. If you do more extreme things, like I'm gonna show you here. So this was an image of a hooded mountain tanager that I took in Ecuador. I love the perch, I love the bird, I like his pose, I like everything. I do not like this branch that's in front of his tail or the branch behind his head. 
So for me, I'm not entering this photo in a contest or anything. So I cloned them out. It's a much better photo without them. Um, but it's totally up to you. They're your images. So where you go on the spectrum of processing, it's up to you. But if you do something like this, I would never enter this photo in a contest unless it's a digital creations. Now is time for my commercial break. If you want to learn about Photoshop, and especially as it applies to nature photography, I have written several guides. People seem to like them. Uh, the main one, the biggest one is called Post-Processing Simplified, and it'll walk you through everything I do from culling to raw processing to basic workflow to much more advanced things. It has videos. It has downloadable actions that you can just load into Photoshop. It has everything you need. So if you're interested, you can check that out on my website. If you've done that and you want to go a little further, I also have these ones that are called Process With Me. And they're a little different. Basically, you, you get the ebook and you download three of my photos. So you'll get my photos. And then there's a video of me processing my photo, the same one that you have. And just like the name says, you process with me. So we, you watch me on YouTube, you have the file, I have the file, and we process it along together. And those ones I kind of show you new different tricks and techniques and things that I've learned along the way. So start, if you're gonna, if you're interested, start with the big one, post-processing simplified. And if you think that was, that was good, I learned some, some good things, then you can graduate on to process with me. I see a little um, chat thing just popped up here. Have you used Lightroom to process? So I don't use Lightroom. Um, for a few reasons, um, Lightroom, as far as the raw processing, is identical to Adobe Camera Raw, a tiny bit different interface. You can do everything the same in Lightroom. Where Lightroom falls short for me and why I don't like to use it is it, it doesn't have the true ability to work in layers, which layers unlocks huge creative potential in Photoshop. And the other thing is you can't do actions as effectively as in Photoshop. And for me, like if, if I could show you a screenshot of my Photoshop, I have dozens and dozens of actions that I use. Like for example, I have a website. So I have a little action for my web pictures that just in one click, resize, sharpen, add my signature, border, drop shadow, change the color space, save it in the right folder. That takes literally one second with an action. So without actions, I just, I'm not interested in Lightroom. It's not a bad program, but you can't go as far creatively. With the way that Adobe products are purchased right now, if you are in the creative cloud, um, like you're doing the monthly subscription, you have Photoshop. So you have Lightroom and Photoshop if you're in the most up-to-date version. So um, you can do tons in Lightroom. It's not, I'm not saying it's a bad program. It's a great program. I just, I, I like to go a little further with the creative side of Photoshop. So that's why it just, it doesn't bring anything to the table for me. So I don't use it. Okay. On to the second last talk. I think it's the second last slide um, about sharing your work. Now you guys obviously subscribe to this because you're members of the camera club. So obviously you guys like to share your work, but I always just think I have people come on my tours. They take tens of thousands of photos. They go on other tours. They come on more of my tours. And I've never seen a single one of their photos. I just think it's a shame because I know they're taking really good photos. And so I think that everybody should find some way to share their photos. So you guys know this. You're a camera club members. You have a photo contest. I already heard about that. Um, maybe you join Flickr. Maybe you join Instagram. Maybe you have a website of your own. Maybe you have a quarterly email that you send out to your bird loving friends. Maybe you enter photo contests. My wife loves to print a little photo book of our yearly adventures every year and just a 30 page little book that could be on the coffee table to show to grandma when she comes over. Um, it doesn't matter, but just, I just think it's so important to share your work. So don't forget that. Last main slide of the talk is a little bit about gear. Uh, when it comes to birds, I have to say bigger does tend to be better. And I'm talking, of course, about the lens. Um, birds are small and they tend to be shy. They don't want us to get close to them usually. So it's very helpful to have a massive telephoto lens and a camera that has a lot of megapixels. 
this is really no way to sugarcoat that. Um, but if you have a big lens, you probably also need a pretty sturdy tripod. This catches a lot of people by surprise when they first get into bird photography because they just, they don't know that, shoot, I'm going to have to carry around a tripod all the time now too. And people tend to be reluctant about that at first, but it is pretty important if you want to get really sharp photos. It's nice too with a big lens because when you have your tripod out, you don't have to carry it all the time. You can set it down when you're listening or looking around for birds or whatever. Um, flash can be really useful, but it's by no means mandatory, but it can be helpful. There's lots of gadgets that we, we talked about. If you have a basic kit though, every digital SLR on the market today is plenty good enough for what you need to get started and vastly superior to the top of the line professional bodies from five years ago. So you have a great camera. The most important thing that most bird photographers could invest their time and money into is learning more about birds. Spending time in the field, do your homework on eBird, Xenocanto, Cloudbirders, get a field guide. That will probably help you more than jumping on the B&H website and buying more equipment. Um, when you start to understand your subjects, there are some, I don't want you to feel like, oh, shoot, I saw this bird photo presentation, but the guy said I have to buy a $15,000, 600 millimeter lens. Not even sure if I like bird photography yet. You don't need that to take great photos of birds, but you do probably want to pick the right scenarios. So for example, if you maybe just have like a, let's say you have a 300 millimeter lens or even a 300 millimeter zoom, and hopefully like a crop body, maybe like a, uh, if you're a Canon, maybe it's a Rebel or like a 7D or something, or if you're a Nikon, maybe it's a D500 or a 7200 or something like that. That gives you a little more effective focal length. And if you pick the right subjects, so for example, maybe there's a pond near where you guys live, maybe it's on a golf course or in a public park where people feed the ducks. So maybe there's some ducks that get tame to people and you can get really close to them and you could still take great photos of birds. Maybe you guys have a place near you that in the spring shorebirds maybe migrate through. Shorebirds will let you get super close to them if you use good technique. So if you walk straight up to the bird like I'm standing there, they're probably going to fly away. But if you watch the birds and you notice they seem to be feeding from over there to over there. So what I'm gonna do is not go towards them. I'm gonna go over where I think they might be going quietly, slowly. And if I get too close to them, I'm gonna start getting down lower and lower and lower. And I'm gonna lay down on the ground and I'm gonna wait for them to come over to me. Instead of chasing them, I'm gonna wait for them to come to me. I've had shorebirds walk into my lens hood when I've been laying on the ground. So they just stop seeing you like a person. They see you like a log or a rock and even with a shorter lens, you can get great photos. So you don't have to have a huge lens, although it is quite helpful. And that is the end of my talk. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, if you wanna see more of my photos, there's my website, it's just my name. If you Google Glenn and birds, I'm sure it'll come up. Um, little plug, if anyone is interesting, of course, um, you saw, I mentioned some of my eBooks. I have ones about Flash, about Photoshop, about setting up cameras. Um, so those are on my website under the books tab and you'll find them all there. And some people find that they learn better through like one-on-one. -on -one. So I do also do like Zoom Photoshop lessons. Those tend to work really well. If you want like a crash course, those can work well. With a, if it wasn't COVID era, I would be trying to encourage you to come on an exciting tropical photo tour, but I, we're unfortunately not quite through this pandemic yet. But if you're looking out ahead and you think that that would be something fun and exciting to do, I encourage you to check out my website in the workshops tab. You'll at least see a list of the different places that I go. And uh, if you are interested down the road, just shoot me an email and say, hey, I might, might be interested in more information about this trip or any trip or whatever. And then you'll be the first to know when I 
when we get back rolling. Not really advertising any tours for next year, as we talked about. We kind of we kind of got to get all all vaccinated up before we can do it safely. So, um, anyways, thanks for your attention. And at this point, if anyone has any questions about anything, feel free to unmute yourselves and shoot them my way. Anybody have questions? It was great. It was a great presentation. I don't have a question, but I thank you. It was an awesome presentation. Oh, no worries, Mary. I hope everyone learned at least one new tip and um, enjoyed the photos. And like I said, if you think of a question while drifting off to sleep tonight, just shoot me an email. You'll find my email in the about tab there on my website, and you can just drop me an email and I'll be happy to happy to answer. Any Are questions. there links to your social? Yes, I see at the bottom. There's links yep. to all your social media at the bottom. Yeah. Um, for those of you who came on late, I, I Glenn is also a wonderful woodworker. And uh, some of that's on his Instagram, his personal Instagram page. Does that link to your inst your personal or your uh, that one? That one goes to the company one. The so company you'll be, one. You'll yeah. be stuck with just birds, but you can. I'm pretty easy to track down online. Yeah, if you just search for Glenn Bartley, you'll see both of them come up, and you'll find all um, the stuff. He's he's got some beautiful woodworking out there for those of you who might be interested in that as well. Um, so, yes. Uh, uh, question. Yeah, sure. I've lost your video, so I'm hoping you have my audio here. Yeah, I can hear you. What, what is your opinion of shooting in an aviary? Well, I would say it's a, it could be a great way to practice. I mean, those birds are are super used to people. It, because it's a even a big aviary is can be small in terms of like nature. So you could have a hard time lining up nice backgrounds, but definitely. Um, you could get some great shots. You probably want to disclose those if you're posting them or certainly in a contest that they were captive subjects. But it's just like going to like a butterfly gardens if you wanted to practice your macro photography. You can get so much practice in, in like an afternoon. And I think if you're just getting into bird photography, it could be an awesome little like field trip to do and just get some practice and get some really cool subjects. Um, <clears throat> one thing to be aware of, if it's like a heated space, like a I don't know, aviary might be somewhere where they like heat it and it might be actually humid too. And if it's um, cold winter and you go into hot, humid aviary, you're gonna fog up like crazy. So um, just factor that in and you ideally, you kind of need to let your equipment acclimatize to the space. So don't plan to go for like half an hour and <laughs> nail a bunch of shots and leave because it's not gonna happen. Your gear might fog up and but I think those are great things to do. Like, like I said, if you're into macro stuff and maybe you have like a butterfly gardens near where you live, it's such a fun little day shoot to go. And you have like hundreds of subjects and so many different kinds. I would say that's the same with an aviary. I have a question. Um, what, how do you feel about, um, I, I assume you shoot Canon based on some of the images that I've, um, saw you show what do you think about the new uh, mirrorless mirrorless have you have you moved towards mirrorless or are you thinking about it yeah so that's a great question so spoiler alert we're all going to be moving to mirrorless yeah that's <laughs> true <laughs> probably your next camera will be mirrorless um i haven't done it yet just because <clears throat> to be honest the canon offering sounds amazing the r5 but it's quite an expensive camera. I'm not really traveling much right now. So to be honest, it's like getting close to 8,000 bucks um, Canadian, which is like 50 cents American. Um, and um, so I just haven't taken the jump yet. It's also a full frame body and I'm kind of keeping my fingers crossed that they might release. It seems like what they're doing in the Canon, sorry for Nikon people, this is kind of boring, but basically what it seems like Canon's doing is replacing their, so like the R5 is the replacement to the 5D. The R6 is the replacement to the 6D. They haven't put out the pro mirrorless body, which I'm sure is gonna be called the R1. And I'm hoping that they will come out with an R7, which would be the replacement to the 
series of cameras that I really like, which has been the 70 series, which is what I still shoot with. So that would likely be at a lower price point um, and perhaps higher frame rate and things like that, if, if that's even possible. But that would be a really interesting camera. If they had that out now, I would buy it tomorrow. But I'm just kind of waiting to see because just the way things are with COVID and like, you know, not leading tours and not having the normal revenue that I have, I'm just kind of like, eh, I don't know if I want to spend $8,000 for something that's probably going to sit in the closet right now. So, but yes, we're all going to mirrorless, like it or not. And there's some amazing potential to mirrorless once they start unlocking some of the software stuff that they can do. Like it, it's really going to open some, some new horizons for us. Thank you. But why do you use uh, aperture priority and not shutter priority? So that's a good question. So it tends to be that the more important variables for what I'm trying to do tend to be the aperture and the ISO. Typically for birds, when you're shooting in the field, especially in the dark tropical surroundings, the limiting factor tends to be your shutter speed. And by that, I mean, it's often darker than you would like it to be. So I kind of know that I'm mostly going to be shooting pretty wide open. Maybe not all the way at F4, but probably somewhere between F4 and F6.3 most of the time. Uh, in the odd occasion, you get some nice brighter light and you can stop down to F8 or maybe even F9. But most of the time, I'm going to be throttling my aperture and my ISO, and the shutter speed is kind of going to do what it's going to do. The tendency with shutter speed priority would be to say, like, okay, well, for a sharp photo, I think I want to keep it at like a 500th of a second, but I don't want my ISO to go above 800. And you'd just be hitting up against the, the your camera would be blinking F4 at you, saying, it's not bright enough. And so the alternative would be to put it in auto ISO, but then that would float your ISO higher than you might be comfortable with. So I, like I said too, I think the most two, the most useful modes are probably gonna be manual or aperture priority. And then it depends, if I was the type of photographer that shot mostly in a much more controllable scenario from blinds or like, if I was shooting wildlife, like going to Yellowstone and just shooting a bunch of bison walking around in the snow, I would shoot manual because it's way easier to just you're student shooting a very static situation in the tropical rainforest with a bird that is jumping all over the place. He's in the shadow with a sunny background. He's in the shade with a shade background. Now he's in the sun with the shade background, trying to adjust manual settings for some, something that's changing that quickly. It tends to make a lot more sense to my brain to be able to, see what's happening and throttle my exposure compensation very quickly based on what I'm seeing. So that's why, that's why aperture priority makes more sense to me based on the sort of challenging scenarios that I tend to be confronted with. But I'm not saying that's right in every scenario, as I've said earlier, it, it really depends on your brain, what you're shooting and what you're comfortable with. So if, if, if shutter speed priority for you is working and you're getting great photos, keep doing it. That's nothing wrong with that. Do you use um, auto ISO ever? Rarely. Um, mostly only when doing flight shooting because while you can limit how the cap on how far it will go, I find that, like I said, I kind of, I'm like very in tune with when I get down into those lower shutter speeds I know the sound of my shutter and I know when it starts to sound a little too slow and based on what my subject's doing, I might throttle my ISO up. I've also enabled my camera so that I can change my ISO very quickly with sort of like a just touch of a button. So I can really change my ISO very quickly if needed. Um, but auto ISO can be a great tool. Um, if you sort of get comfortable using it in certain scenarios like flight shooting, if you say, okay, I need for this bird, I really am gonna need at least this shutter speed and I want this aperture and let the ISO float to whatever it needs to be to achieve that, then it can be a great tool. So it's just important to know, I never said this in the talk, but it's always good 
piece of literature to read is your camera manual <laughs> and really get comfortable with the different settings. And I'll tell you those new mirrorless, I haven't bought them yet, but there's a lot of new functionality. And so if you do jump, make that jump to the mirrorless, make sure you take the time to really read through the manual because there's a lot of new settings and things to be aware of. Got a question about ISO. Sure. Yeah. Um... Do you find much difference from, say, 100 ISO to 800 or better in noise or old school grain in the images? Yeah, I definitely do, Mike. Um, it will depend on the camera you're using. So obviously, like the higher end and full frame cameras. So, Mike, are you Canon or a Nikon guy or something else? I shoot Canon. Canon? Okay, yeah. So. Um, a camera like a 5D Mark IV or a 1DX will have better performance, as I'm sure you're aware, than like a Rebel or a 7D. Um, with my camera, the 7D Mark II, there's a big difference between the ISO 100 and 800. I very, very, very rarely shoot an ISO 100 just because, again, like I don't, I just don't have that quantity of light to shoot in. I would say that I tend to shoot you know, 320 to sort of 800 and reluctantly I'll go to 1600. Um, but it totally depends on your camera. Some, like if you're with a 5D, you could definitely push that a little further. Um, and, you know, like the Nikon folks have had a nice tool at their disposal, The like the D5 and the D850 are, you know, some really good noise characteristics in those cameras. The other thing worth mentioning is software. In the last year or so, um, there's some pretty awesome new software. Um, I use a package called Topaz. They have a program called Denoise, Topaz Denoise. If you haven't tried it, I highly encourage you to download the trial version and run an image that's like at ISO 1600 or something through it. And you will be shocked. It is unbelievable how good of a job it does at removing noise to the point where it like, it buys you a couple stops of ISO performance, basically. Um, if you are interested also, I'm gonna make another plug. You can get a discount on the program if you wanna buy it. There's a link in my, also if you're interested in, in any, any equipment that you, if you wanna see, hey, what does Glenn use? There's a gear tab there on my website and it lists all the stuff I use and kind of recommend down to like the flash bracket and gloves and you name it. And in there, there's a promo code for the Topaz software. So if you do decide to buy it, you can get, I think it's 10 or 15% off there. Um, but it is definitely worth getting the free trial. If you use Photoshop or Lightroom, it, sound, it looked like Janet's maybe used some of the software. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty crazy how good it is. Um, I was shocked. I was shocked. I was not really a fan. I used a lot of plugins and it's like, eh, I can, I can do that good in Photoshop. You just have to have some skill. I can't do as good as Topaz because the ability of it to select around fine little feathers and mask that out is just ridiculous. So definitely if you're a bird photographer, nature photographer, it is worth your time to download the free trial and test it out because you'll be shocked. Well, thank you. No worries. Well, I don't hear any, uh, any other questions, so I might let you guys retire to your next beverage and I may retire to my dinner time. All right. And uh, again, thanks for having me. And like I said, if you have any questions, shoot me a note. Otherwise I wish you guys all a happy holidays and, and all the best for the, the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Okay. Cheers guys. Have a good night. I'm signing off. All right. Everyone else. Um, we do have our monthly, Oops, I have to hit the stop recording here. Um, for those who want